Thank you for tuning into Stepping Stones of Faith. Stepping Stones of Faith is a ministry of Claytonville United Brethren Church. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning Sunday school starts at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship starts at 10.30 a.m. If you would like to join us for any of these services, our address is 106 Elizabeth Street, Claytonville, Illinois, 60926. We hope to see you this morning. We are going to continue today. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 today. If you're in the Red Bible, it is 996. So if you turn to 997, you're in one page back. That's where we're at. Starting in verse 12 today. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. <clears throat> Paul writes, Furthermore, when I came to Traus to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother. So taking my leave of them, I went from there into Macedonia. Now thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and through us reveals the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God a sweet fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who perish. To the one who, who are, to the one we are the fragrance of death which brings death and to the other the fragrance of life which brings life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are now not as many, for we are not as many are who peddle the word of God. Instead, being sent by God, we sincerely speak in Christ in the sight of God. Now, some things we want to unpack today. Paul's, it says in the Bible here in the subheading, Paul's anxiety in Troas, or Troas. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and the door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother. We have to understand who Titus was. Paul and Titus worked together. Paul, was, Paul and Titus were partners in these missionary journeys. And he had no rest in his spirit because he couldn't find Titus. He says, so taking my leave of them, I went from there to Macedonia. So he went in search of Titus. He went in search of Titus because he couldn't find him. Historically, I think he sent him. A, he sent him ahead of himself to, to Teos or Troas, and he couldn't find him. So he went to Macedonia. So there's anxiety there. There's anxiety there. He says, "Now thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ, and triumph tri and through us reveals the fragrance of His knowledge in every place." Now, <clears throat> we can triumph in our anxiety, right? How many of us have never suffered from anxiety? Nobody's hands are up. You know why? Because it's a common thing. Anxiety happens in a common, it's commonplace. They give it names like general anxiety disorder or... Um, things like that. But everybody suffers from anxiety from time to time. And it is in Christ that we can triumph through that anxiety. Now, I'm not saying that clinical anxiety doesn't need medication. I'm not saying that. I don't 
think there's a place in it. It's pro not proper to say that. I, what I'm saying is generally everyone de deals with anxiety in a general, general circumstance. There are some that are clinical needing of medication. And I'm not saying any, making any less of that. But I am saying generally speaking, we all suffer from anxiety in one way, shape, or form. And we can triumph over it in Christ. He had some anxiety. He says, now thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and through us reveals the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Now we can triumph through God and as we go through our places of influence, we can bring the word of God to others. We talked about that in Sunday school and how important it is that our influence be uh, shown and how important it is that we walk with God and we are a witness and a testimony to those around us. It is important. Now thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and through us reveals the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The fragrance of his knowledge. Does that mean when, I, when we walk through a building we've got to smell good? No. I know when Jim walks in, we can tell when Jim walks in because he always smells so good. We can tell his, his uh, soap and deodorant lingers through the vestibule in the, in the church. Is that how we're supposed to do it? Is that how we're supposed to be? Walk in, make sure we smell good? That's not what he's talking about here, is it? What does it say about our prayers in the book of Revelation to the Lord? It says that our prayers and our worship is a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. Right? That doesn't mean we smell good and God enjoys our scent. That means that we are worshiping God and that action of worship is like a sweet-smelling savor. It's like something that he enjoys and wants to savor in his nostrils. When we bring the word of God to other people, when we walk with God and we do that which God wants us to do and we triumph through our anxiety, we are to bring that fragrance of knowledge of Christ to others. Now there is something to be said for someone who has gone through anxiety and depression and able to get victory over that and then go through and mentor others through the same problems. There is something important in that because that brings the people to the knowledge that Christ can help them work through things, walk through things. That's important. The fragrance of his knowledge. Do you ever have, I used to have, um, when I was in college, I had a favorite teacher and I, and I, I even, in, even at a seminary, I had favorite teachers. And when I sat under their teaching, it was like, man, I wanted to hear everything they had to say. I, want, I, took, I had a tape recorder, and I would record the lectures, and I would take notes and record them. And then I would go back, and I would put them on my computer, and I would listen to them again and take more notes. Because I wanted, to, it was like, it was like I needed to hear. I would sit there and I would focus on them. How Wayne is sitting right now is how I sat at my desk all the time, leaned up with my arms over the front, just focused on what they were saying. Because the fragrance of that knowledge was so rich and it was so so uh, um, inviting. I guess it was just it was just so much a thing that I wanted. To, to stay in. We need to have that kind of thing with our lives as well. The things we deal with, medically or non-medically, clinically or non-clinically, Christ can be there with us through it. Christ can walk with us through it. For what reason? For what purpose, you might ask? If he's not going to deliver us, why walk with us through it? For the very purpose of bringing the fragrance of his knowledge to someone else's life. Paul had anxiety in this situation, but he went on. 
and he brought about the knowledge of Christ to those people. And it was the fragrance of that knowledge, the, the desire to be there, the desire to continue on. He had that desire. Do we have that desire when the word is preached, when the word is spoken, when the word is taught? Do we have that desire? Do we want to know Christ in a better and a more attractive way? And when I say that, I mean more intimate way, more, more close, in a, in a more close relationship. Verse 15, for we are, not, we are to God a sweet fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who perish. So we are a sweet-smelling savor. When we follow God, it says it here in the book of Revelation, that our prayers are and our lives are like a sweet-smelling savor unto God. Why is that? When, I, when my kids do what, they want, what I want them to do, that's a nice thing. That's a good thing. When my kids follow everything I tell them to do, when I tell them to do it, which happens somewhat on a regular basis, but they're kids, so you can't expect it 100%, it makes you feel good when they are doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're following through. You could say that that's like a sweet-smelling savor to my nostril. Just like we are to God. Now he goes on and he says, to the one we are a fragrance of death, which brings death. And to the other we are a fragrance of life, which brings life. Now we have to understand this scripture for a second because... Why would God's fragrance bring death to one and life to another? Why is that? Well, let's go back and let's look at some scripture. Think about some scripture where when God said that no unclean thing shall pass over to there, over to heaven, right? And if you're not a follower of God, follower of Christ, following Christ through God, then we are not a sweet-smelling savor. And the word of God brings about death until that person converts. Because when I was a, when I was a youngster, young, well, 23, I got witness to a lot. And my answer was, don't shove your religion down my throat. I don't want to hear it. That was my answer. I didn't take it in as, oh, I want to hear more. I took an offense to it. I took offense to it. And I was angry. Because someone dare tell me about their religion. Now, what was my heart like? What was my demeanor like? Well, my heart was dark as sin, just like it is now, right? And we have to follow through that. We, our hearts are black as sin, that's what it says. But thanks be to God that he saves us, right? But at the time, my heart was black as sin. My demeanor was wrong. My understanding was wrong. And should I stayed on that path, I would be apart from God for eternity. So those words brought death until I converted and brought life. One thing that used to drive me crazy when I was a non-believer was someone that would witness to me. I hated it. I hated it. Partly because I knew I was guilty. Partly because I knew that I needed a Savior and I didn't want to. And in that attitude... That brought, would have brought about death. But when Jesus more talked about, when you ever talk to somebody as a Christian and they're talking to you about the Lord and all of a sudden your faith is bolstered and your spirit is lifted, that's life. The Word of God can bring life as well as death. And we want to bring as many with us as we can 
And is that to discourage us from witnessing because others are going to say, get away from me, I don't want to hear your religion? Slam the door in our face? Does that discourage us? It can. But should it? No. We answer to a higher calling. We talked about it this morning. Uh, what is our prime directive? If you like Star Trek, prime directive was they weren't supposed to involve themselves in, in cultures and change the culture or change the way of living of other beings. They were just supposed to simply observe. That was the prime directive. Our prime directive as Christians is to share the word of God at all costs. Be a witness to others in all things, good and bad. Good and bad. I watched, we watched a documentary last night, the night before last, on Netflix. Nobody here has Netflix, I don't think, do you? But anyway, there was a documentary about, who knows who Bob Ross was? You know who Bob Ross was? Did you know that he went on to do painting shows for 31 consecutive seasons? And do you know if you watch those later seasons from, I think, what is it, 26, season 26 to the end of the series, he dealt with lymphoma, cancer. But watching those episodes, you would never know it. And in his life, the way he lived his life, you, no one knew except for his closest family. It said in the documentary that even the station people didn't know he had cancer until that last season ended because he couldn't go on to do a next one. You see, his life was not consumed by the things of his circumstances but by the things of his mission to paint and make people feel valuable. Our mission as Christians is to share the word of God and show them that Christ values them and Christ loves them regardless of what we're going through. And if we are going through something, sure, go through something, but point those back to Christ. Somebody might say, well, you are dealing with this and how do you deal with this and be a Christian? Jesus Jesus, that's how. He sees me through. Now, to my knowledge, Bob Ross was not a Christian. I didn't speak of that in the documentary. But it does tell you that because he was on a mission of making people feel valuable and making people feel wanted, that didn't deter his circumstances that his circumstances didn't deter his mission. Our circumstances should not deter our mission as believers. We should continue on, continue going forth. That's why some people view Christianity and Christians in a negative light, therefore bringing death to them. And some people welcome it and want it, and like me in that class, sitting like this, and just listening, and just taking it in, recording every word, and writing notes, and then going home and putting it on the computer, and doing the same thing over again, wanting to know. That brought life to me. The same things that could bring death to someone else who doesn't know the Lord. We pray, and we hope, and we and we encourage others to continue on because there, may, there are going to be some who are not following God but will take it to heart and will follow Christ through our example. Through our example. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many are who peddle the word of God Instead, we bring 
we being sent by God, we sincerely speak in Christ in the sight of God. They're not peddling it. What does it mean to peddle something? Remember the old peddlers? We used to call, we used to say, we used to say, this guy's peddling this, peddling that. When I was a kid, you'd see these people walking down, they would come up and they'd sell you. Who, who, who remembers the uh, vacuum cleaner salesman and the encyclopedia salesman? Those are peddlers. They'd peddle their vacuum cleaners and they'd peddle their encyclopedias. You know what? We bought a vacuum cleaner and a set of encyclopedias from, one of, from those people. Because that was before eBay and that was before Amazon and that was before all that stuff. For the internet. You'd have to upgrade your encyclopedias every couple years in order to get new information. But that's what those people do. They're in it for a profit. He says, we're not peddling it. We're not in it for a profit. We're not selling it. We're sent by God. We're not sent by our own, well, I got to have, well, 2022 vernacular. I got to have gas money, so I'm going to go set up a meeting for a uh, Christian meeting and preach a sermon. Hopefully I get a huge offering so I have gas money to go to the next place. That isn't what it's about. Paul said that is not, it is not about peddling. It's about sharing the word of God, being sent by God. Now, I'm not speaking against tent revivals or tent meetings or anything like that where people come and set up tents and share the word of God as long as they're doing it because God directed them to do that, not because they need something. I can remember <clears throat> years ago, we had, we've had two or three people that mow our grass and I mow it now, but two or, you know, we had two or three people that mowed our grass. And I remember one lady we had, she's passed on now, every week on Tuesday, whether it needed to be mowed or not, she was mowing our grass because she needed money. She, she wasn't doing anything bad with it. She just needed the money to get by. So if she needed the money, she would come and mow and I always knew she came in mow because the grass always looked cleaner than it was before. And so I'd hop over to the car and I'd drive over and give her the $20 she wanted. Every single week, regardless if, she, regardless if she needed it, if it needed it or not, she did it. Right? And what I'm saying this to say is because peddlers of the gospel do it not because God is telling them, these people in this community need to hear my word. They're doing it because they want money. For heaven's sakes, look at the tel television, the internet. How many TV preachers are there that tell you, if you want to sow seed into God's word, into God's ministry, send us $100 and God will bless you tenfold. How many times have we heard that? And these people are living in houses and all these kinds of things, living beyond their means and yet, and they're asking for more money every single week. They're peddlers. Maybe they started off called by God. Maybe they started off being sent by God. But the money became more appropriate and more important to them than the word of God. May it never become anything become more important to us than the Word of God. May we always see the Word of God as the prime reason for doing what we're doing. For we are not as many are who peddle the Word of God. Are we that? Am I, are, is, is our church that? I mean, look, we're on, look, at, I'm recording right now. See right there. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. Are we peddling for money? No. No, we're not. I don't do infomercials and put commercials in there and say, if you want to be blessed by God, send Clayville United Brethren Church $100 and we'll, God will bless you 100 fold. I don't do that. Because I don't believe that's appropriate. 
I believe if God is going to bless our church, he's going to do it himself. We don't have to help him out. Amen? We don't have to help God out. God sees our need. God sees our, uh, our circumstances and our desires, and he gives us the, the desires of our hearts. Amen? So we do not peddle as so many do. Instead, being sent by God, we sincerely speak in Christ in the sight of God. There's something important there. Sent by God. That's a call. Right? That's a call. We are called by God. We're sent by God. We are, he says, being sent by God, we sincerely speak in Christ in the sight of God. Sincerely speak in Christ. Not making things up. Not, not doing it for financial gain. Not doing it because, look at me, I'm in front. But sincerely speaking the word of God. In the sight of God. Do you think any of this is hidden from God? Do you think our, devo our, our hearts are hidden from God? Do you think that those TV preachers that say, send me $100 and God will bless you 100, 10 times over, 100 times over, do you think that their core motive is hidden from God? No. It's not hidden from God. We must then, be it behooves us to have our motives correct before God. Why do we do what we do? We ask that question a lot. Why do we do what we do? And that's anything. Anything you might be thinking about. Why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? Those motives got to be ironed out before God, don't they? Because he sees it. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. Our thoughts, our motives, our desires, our angers, our bitterness, our jealousy are not hidden. God can look at it like we're looking at the Bible. He can see what we can do. We're an open book to God. He knows exactly who we are. Even if we fool others, God knows who we are. We might be in the church, and we might be, oh, I'm this, I'm this, but then we walk out the door and we go home and we go, and we're somebody different in our thought pattern, in our mind, and in our heart. We're somebody different. You might fool me, or you might fool others, but you'll never fool God. You'll never fool God. You are an open book to him. And believe me, if we do not repent of those things, we are not going to be with him. We are not going to be with him. And it's unfortunate because people at funerals say, well, at least they're in a better place. If they're a Christian, they're in a better place. And we pray that those that were not Christians in that very few last few moments gave their hearts to the Lord in those last few moments. But if they didn't, they're not in a better place. They're not. We're an open book to God. We're an open book. Nothing's hidden. My life is an open book. My heart is laid bare before the Lord every single moment of my life. And so is yours. My motives, my desires, my, my thoughts, my bitterness, my anger, my resentment is all laid before God, open and bare. And I have to repent. 
And I do on a daily basis, if I want to be honest. But we have to realize that if we think we're hiding from God because nobody knows what's going on in my life or our lives in the church or within our family or within our friends, if we think we're fooling everyone, believe me, we're not. What does it say in the scripture? It says, behold, your sin will find you out. What does that mean? That means pretty soon all will be laid bare and everyone will see, not just God. Because it is hard to keep going and with the charade for a long period of time. People slip up. People slip. People make mistakes and whoop, whoa, I wasn't expecting that person to say that. I wasn't expecting that person to do that. Whoa, I thought, whoa, that's, that's not, that I wasn't expecting that. Pretty soon your sin will find you out. And guess what? God already sees it. And it's in pen, but it is not, it's not all over yet. We can still repent. As long as you can draw breath, you can repent. And you can change your heart and your life. Because it's all laid out. It's all laid bare. God sees it. God sees what we thought about yesterday. God sees how we reacted to situations yesterday. God sees what our motives were yesterday. It's all laid bare. We just have to repent. Amen. So my challenge for you this week is this. Be honest with yourself and be honest with God. In your prayer time, I want you to ask God, and I'm, I'm telling you this because I do this all the time. I do this myself, so I have the right to ask you. I want you to ask God to, for God to show you how he sees your heart, how he views you. And if there is anything that needs to be changed or repented of, for God to reveal those things to you that you may repent. And then the application part is this. If God shows you things, you must repent. And will you do that? Or will you sit on your couch or chair or bed and say, well, that's not really, that's not really appropriate to, that's not bad enough to repent for. That little white lie was not bad enough to repent for. But after all, it was for the greater good, right? Nobody got hurt. Lies are lies. Exaggerations are lies. And you know, the Bible says there's a special place in hell for liars. So, how important is that? How important is that? So that's what I want you to do. Ask God if there's anything you need to repent of. To have him show you and then repent. Amen. That you might be better tomorrow than you are today. Or the next day than you were yesterday, than you were tomorrow. To grow in the grace and knowledge of God, that we would grow in greater fellowship, greater and intimate relationship with God. Amen. Let's go before the Lord. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I pray that you'd bless us and minister to us by your spirit. I pray, Father, that you would help us to search our own hearts, that, Lord, we would be honest with ourselves and honest with you, that, Lord, you would minister to us and you would bless us in all things. And, Father, I pray that you would just be with us right now. Give us the ability to see your grace and your mercy. Give us the ability to understand that, Lord, we are laid bare and you see all things. Lord, I pray you would bless us and minister to us now. 
And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to Stepping Stones of Faith. I pray that you find value in this content. You can also find an audio podcast of this program on all the major podcasting platforms. Just type Stepping Stones of Faith into the podcast search bar. Once again, I'm Pastor Josh. Thank you for joining me today.